Well, thank you everybody for joining. I want to introduce you to uh, an amazing panel that we have today. Everybody is interested in how they can uh, be great with social media for their for their own careers, for their uh, for their bands. And I don't think I've ever seen a panel like this one of social media for music. Uh, uh, geez, nothing like this, this much expertise all in one place. So let me quickly uh, go around and introduce everyone and then we'll start to dive in. Uh, I have, uh, let's see, Rohan Ocean here from Rock Tees Shirts. Rohan, all right, good. So everybody can see who you is. Uh, I'll throw names underneath everybody and all that sort of jazz. Uh, I got Jeff Funk from Double X Artists, uh, social media manager there. And I got Finn McKenty from Punk Rock NBA. Almost everybody on YouTube knows who he is already. Uh, I have Mike Mowry, of course, from 10th Street Entertainment. David Puckett is here from Hyperculture. You may also know him from We Came as Romans and the drum kit, which sits behind them. Uh, so fantastic. Thank you all for uh, being here. Jeff, real quick to get us started. Um, as a fan, I get upset when the bands that I love only start tweeting and posting and Instagramming about a few weeks before they want to take my money. And, uh, but I also understand that like Facebook likes don't pay the rent as they always say. So what is the argument for having an evergreen strategy on social media for bands? Well, I mean, for example, like if you look at <clears throat> from an algorithmic standpoint, you know, for, on Instagram, for example, you know, frequency is a massive part of, you know, it's an ever-changing algorithm, but it's still a massive part of, of the current and, and, um, algorithm. So if you are maintaining that consistency with, with posting, you're working with the algorithm versus against it. So you're, in theory, getting more visibility. Um, you know, and it's just, and consistency is, is such an important thing across all socials for for artists um, and just to work with their each respective algorithm. So you would be saying that like just having an evergreen strategy is what's going to be an investment in uh, that'll pay off once you get to that album cycle or that tour that you want to promote. Yeah, it's important to have a combination of both evergreen and reactionary, like reactive content. Um, so you're also paying attention to what's what's happening, you know, currently um, and, and heightening your the potential virality in your posts. Um, so I think it's important to have a combination of both. Awesome, cool. Rohan, how do you differentiate uh, strategies for either growing a following or generating income uh, or marketing, I guess, uh, as far as like a, for a direct sale or for a direct uh, uh, purpose? Um, I have a somewhat of a slight advantage where I look after bands that have had quite an uh, extensive career um, and it's sort of by design and it's sort of uh, by luck I guess and and a few other things but uh, the bands I have are probably 30 year plus acts uh, apart from one um, that allows the language I use even when I'm trying to take someone's money even when it's a merch drop even when it's it's pointed towards specifically click here and buy this is I find the language to be paramount. So if I was to go in on a particular artist and say, sale starts now, no one gives a shit. If I can link it to some key point of history, even as simple as a hashtag, which which these days says a lot, communicates a lot. If, if I'm able to, and I try to do this uh, across the board all the time, if I'm able to explain to whoever sees that, that, that whoever posted it or, or it comes from the band's official account, that they are aware of their tribe, of their group, of their friends, of their fans, uh, I find it has a... Uh, a more of an impact than the normal just bashing stuff out. Um, yeah. No, oh, that's awesome. Uh, and, and with the language that you're using, sort of to combine it with what Jeff was talking, does any of that language, uh, do you find it 
helps the algorithm or is it really just focused on helping the community? It helps the algorithm in the fact that, uh, as we all know, at some point, I don't know when this was, I call it a snowball algorithm where the more people that see it, the more people get hit by it. Uh, it works with that because you've got the scroll effect. People can just keep going. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, whatever, whatever. They see something that, you, that you've said or they see something that just hooks them for that one extra moment. Um, then that opens it up to more and more and more people. So it certainly does. And, and then that has a longer term effect. So there's the instant effect of uh, we're, we're getting people to notice the post. The uh, extra effect on that is that more fans are noticing that this is the real deal and are following. So it's the two, it, it's beneficial for both. Got it. Excellent. Then, uh, of all these different platforms that exist, are there demographic or engagement or um, uh, sort of like level of fandom as in like, you know, casual versus, you know, super fan and all the range in between on each of these platforms that artists really should be aware of and so that they can take advantage of them? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the answer to that is going to vary for every individual. I think that there's typically going to be one platform in which you have the broadest audience and your relationship with the people there will probably be less deep. And then there's going to be other platforms where you have a deeper, but uh, less, you have a deeper relationship with a smaller number of people. For example, um, you know, there's people who like, for example, mine is YouTube. You know, I have 200 and 18,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is, you know, and maybe a million, million and a half people a month see that stuff on YouTube, but I have no idea who they are. Like, I can't really, I mean, I respond to comments and stuff, but it's, it's a, a fairly shallow relationship with them. On Instagram, I have like 38,000. So that's the 38,000 people who have chosen to follow me and engage with me and can be a little bit more personal there. And then my podcast gets maybe 5,000 downloads in, uh, of, of every episode. But the relationship there is the deepest. Now, not, now, that's for me. There's other people where their main platform could be Twitch. They may have a zillion people on Twitch. And then it's about using that platform to build relationships with your audience elsewhere. So uh, I, I think it's not so much about any one platform. It's just about that idea of understanding which of the platforms are you using to reach a broad audience and, uh, uh, and, and build and grow that audience and which platforms are you using to deepen your relationships with the people who care about you the most? So for artists who are just getting going and you know, they're not, they're not hiring, hiring a social media manager, they're just pulling up their uh, sleeves and trying to do it themselves. Like uh, what would you advise them as to where to start to find the platform that's going to bring them at least that, 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 that initial swell of followers? Uh, is it artist dependent or are there some two or three that you would recommend? You just got to start here. Uh, yes, I think it's artist dependent. I think you should start with the one that you know best. That's always going to be the right, well, not always, but it's usually going to be the right answer. Uh, not Facebook. It's strange to me that a lot of rock people are still interested in Facebook um, for organic reach, which uh, I, I would say is a thing of the past. But, you know, there's somebody that's making it work. So even, even that is, uh, even that can, can work. So I would say just start with the one that you understand and you're passionate about the most and go from there. It's, you know, there's no one right answer. David, there's a, a balance, I would imagine, between artists who want to share enough in order to, to uh, uh, you know, deepen that relationship that, that Finn's talking about with, uh, with their fans while still protecting their privacy as much as they can. Uh, what, uh, how do you think the best bands out there on social media, the, the ones who do it best, what is it, what is it that they do that, that uh, to separate, to find that line between yeah. privacy and sharing? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I, I think first and foremost, you know, continuity is, is unbelievably important, not only when it comes to developing like your delivery algorithm and kind of conditioning your social followers to have a certain level of expectation with your uh, content, but it also creates, you know, a brand identity or brand ethos. And that's something that kind of takes your, if you want to sound super salesy and use the term like 
um, brand customer relationship or whatnot, uh, it, it takes it to a secondary level to where it's no longer just, oh, I like this band as a band, but I like this band and everything that they stand for as a person. And there's a plethora of ways that artists can do that down from color schemes um, you know, and if you ask anybody, like, what was Beartooth's color scheme for the last album cycle? Even if you don't know who Beartooth, like, or even if you don't like Beartooth, I can almost guarantee you that anybody who dabbles in the hard rock world knows that it's black and orange. Um, and so all of a sudden, there's a statement that's made there, but it also starts to kind of bring you into almost the psychology of the brand or the ethos or the identity of the brand that's being uh, presented. So we do something with with a lot of our clients, be it in the media or the entertainment space or bands, or be it in the small business world where it's, you know, if you were to have to write down, um, you know, a personality profile about your brand, about your band, about your business, what would that be? What would its name be? Um, where would this person like to hang out? What would their friends look like? And as cheesy and as corny as it sounds, getting some ideas and kind of personifying that on paper and then using that to reverse engineer your social media strategy makes it uh, actionable. You know, and I think that's where a lot of people get stuck is, crap, we don't know what to post, we're running out of content and it can get so overcomplicated. Um, and so it also kind of presents you the opportunity to detach from personal life, uh, which, you know, I think there's a lot of artists that, for artists that are in the public eye, like 21 Pilots would be a great example. You don't really see Tyler or Josh posting much about their personal life or what goes on behind the scenes because they do have a massive uh, cult following and, and, and a semi, in the best way possible, aggressive fan base. And they want to have a level of privacy. But the way that they've branded themselves is they create an experience for their fans uh, to engage with them on a personal relational level that is outside of their actual independent personal lives. I love it. I, I see just to recap, just so that people understand, like you're, you're talking about developing like a fan avatar almost. Yeah, absolutely. That, absolutely. That everybody is, should be speaking to. And then once you've identified that fan avatar, you're able to then uh, figure out what it is that you need to say and when you need to say it, how often you need to say it. Okay. I, exactly. I love it. Exactly. So to follow up on that, like for so many bands, their personality is a huge component of their brand, you know? Mm. Um, so uh, are there um, uh, times where, uh, you know, they've, they've, they've shared too much and you got to figure out a way to pull them back without disturbing the brand? And then how would you find that balance? Mm. That's a good one. Uh... I, I think there's either either two ways to go about it, slow and steady, and consistency is the key. Like you could, I'm a, a big follower of Donald Miller, if you're familiar with him and kind of his uh, approach on marketing and, and narrative-based marketing. And a lot of it boils down to kind of creating the path of least resistance. Um, so you almost kind of have to create a narrative, uh, you know, so we'll explain it this way. If someone's walking through a jungle, there's, are we allowed to cuss on here? Can we cuss? Is that fine? Should I not cuss? Does it matter? Okay. If someone's walking through a jungle or a forest and there's not a path in front of him, there's all kinds of shit that they're going to have to cut through and move out of the way, right? In this uh, kind of explanation, that's going to be your, your customer, your user, the prospect fan you're trying to win over. You as a, as a brand, right? You're marketing. When you're posting on social media, when you're interacting with someone, you're trying to create a path for them to follow. So when it comes to kind of, you know, say someone did um, get too far into their personal world uh, as far as like the artist posting or whatnot, they're wanting to pull back. If you suddenly, you're leading people down this path and then you suddenly pivot, it's going to shake those users a lot. It's going to incite maybe some, um, I don't know, some negative curiosity. Uh, it could incite some kind of insecurity or, or less confidence in the brand itself. So being able to assess and say, okay, I went down this path too far. Now we need to veer left, but there's a whole bunch of trees and bushes and shit here. So let's start chopping at that bit and try to make this a seamless transition. If it's something like for a band moving from one album cycle to another, you can absolutely do a hard reset. Um, you know, kind of going on the delete your social profiles always makes a big statement, gets people talking, gets people curious, but you have to have actionable content to follow through on. And I think that's where a lot of bands get lost in translation um, is they first and foremost don't create enough of a brand, brand identity or brand consistency for the users to really 
um, have a, like a foundation to exist on. And when they try to switch it up, they just lose people and lose people and lose people. That's awesome. Thank you. Mike, uh, uh, David brought up a couple things right there that are, are really cool. Awesome. Uh, uh, obviously, like the, the, um, uh, the brand and how you can, uh, uh, you know, stick to colors and things like that that are really, really important. Um, but also that hard reset that comes with an album cycle. Can you talk a little bit about how in your experience, uh, the artists that you've worked with in the past, what is that like branding that happens for uh, a particular album cycle and how that is communicated and planned for uh, social media? Yeah, of course. Um, and it's a great question. I think so much of it, you know, really stems from, uh, of course, what the music's about, what the album's about. With most of the artists that I work with, we then, you know, hire an experienced designer uh, that really can get the vision um and go along with that and create something that yeah makes sense and then it sort of i mean i want to say it all follows very naturally um and that's just because i've done it as of these guys you know countless numbers of times but for me and that's part of what this panel is you know i've worked with every single one of the people on here it's finding you know people like this that you know, if if I was going into a new album cycle and any one of these guys was on the team for social media, I would consult them in addition to the artist, right? In addition to not only the artists that I'm representing, but the artists that we're hiring to create all of the graphics, just to see if it makes sense, if there's anything that they can can give input on. So that's typically how it's done. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I and you know, really, this is like a a great side effect. I think of of this kind of panels. I can just I can hear <laughs> musicians listening to these people and go like, I, I, this is all stuff I wanted to know, but there's no way I could do this and do this well. And it ends up being a great argument for why these roles exist and why, uh, you know, bands, once they have some sort of budget are taking advantage of it. Um, Jeff, uh, you know, like another thing that I always hear from, from musicians who are trying so hard to do this DIY is to, hey, I need to be a great songwriter. I need to be a great performer. I need to be great at this, that, the other thing. I got to be a great accountant. You want me to be great on 12 different platforms too. So are there any third party uh, SaaS tools that, that either you use or you recommend your artists use to try to uh, streamline the process of being great at social media in general? Yeah, for, I mean, for creating more, you know, DSP type contests, I like Tone Den is a great third party app uh, gleam is another great for contesting integration into social media um for um you know like tweet to uh follow to tweet is another great one for it's a third party uh, twitter app um for you know for live streaming personally you know we've been doing a lot with bands in town lately i really enjoy working with them and i think the infrastructure that they've created surrounding the live streaming atmosphere has been has been great. The same with with Veeps. They're another um, uh, third party that we work with with doing live streaming, and those are um, those are paid live streams. But they're you know it's a great they do a great job of it of, uh, of gating that and the productions. You know it really can work on any level. And do you have any sort of recommendations for artists who are trying to do this DIY and they're just absolutely overwhelmed by you know twitch and twitter and facebook and instagram and TikTok and, and every single platform's got a different image size gosh darn it you know what i mean yeah i mean it, you know and really in order to be on the forefront you know as i'm as i'm sure these guys can attest it's you know you really need to be paying attention to blogs and in the beauty of, of youtube you know it's the second largest search engine in the world and really there's an answer for everything so if you hear someone you know, talking about, you know, shadow banning, or you hear someone talking about, you know, the, the Facebook algorithm and components of, you know, like search components for, you know, whatever, like for Twitter or, or anything, you can just Google that or look it up on YouTube and, and be able to find the answers for yourself because it is a lot. I mean, that's one thing about digital, you know, I've been doing it for, for, for 12 years, you know, working at an agency and it's the thing that's never changed is you're never really done. I mean, there's always something that you can be doing. There's always new technologies, you know, algorithms are, are, are forever changing. So, you know, they're ever changing algorithms. So it's, you know, 
everything, you can never really be completely done. You know, there's always something you can be doing. Um, you know, even just starting at like, you know, YouTube, if you wanted to, now's a great time to be optimizing your videos. So if you're an upcoming artist or a label, you know, just looking through YouTube or, or Google search to find ways to, to YouTube or to optimize your, all of your YouTube videos. There's, there's so many ways and there's always, you know, they're always with partnerships. They're always continuing to, to build more and more. Well, Finn, I want to ask you about optimizing YouTube because that seems to be an awesome segue. But before you answer that, if you don't mind, like I'm thinking back to 22 years ago, last time I was in a van, there was the guy who drove, there was the guy who wrote, you know, who had the map and, you know, that would be like my social media strategy now. Someone would be the Instagram guy, someone would be the Facebook, but I wouldn't want to give any of those guys passwords. Like who, who, how, do, yeah, what do you suggest as far as like, you know, who gets the passwords to the social media platforms in the van? Well, I mean, if, if oh. sorry, you're asking me or? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, well, I guess that's up to you guys. If you don't trust each other, then there's a problem. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Like, if you don't trust each other at that level, then somebody, you probably made the wrong call with who you let in the band. Uh, as far as optimizing videos goes, there's, a, uh, if anyone's interested in this, there's a guy named Brian Dean who has a site called Backlinko. If you Google YouTube Marketing Hub, it'll tell you everything you need to know. But the main piece of advice I would give everybody is uh, don't think that an app is the answer or don't think that, you know, tweaking some technical thing is going to give, is going to like open the floodgates. I wish it was that simple. It's not like you need to make, you need to be more creative. You need to have a, a stronger point of view. You need to have something clever and interesting and entertaining or informative, whatever. You got to have something to say. If you don't have anything to say, if it's just another picture of a bunch of dudes in a warehouse or whatever, some guy with a guitar, all the optimization in the world, it's multiplying zeros. You know, nobody is going to give a shit. Uh, and I don't buy it. The excuse of people saying they don't have time because they have to be a, you know, a musician, a performer. Like, there's tons of like 19 year old rappers that crush it on social media and make all their own shit and, you know, distribute all their own music that do it all themselves. It's a bullshit excuse. Sorry, I got to unmute myself. So, uh, so you're firmly in the camp of quality over quantity. Uh, that's one way to put it. Um, but I mean, I would say both actually. Um, I just, you just, it, this is, you're, you're trying to do something very difficult. I mean, if you're looking for shortcuts, you've already kind of lost. Yeah. You know, there's, there's things that may save you a little bit of time, but if you're looking for a way to make it easy, you might as well give up now because it's not easy. Yeah. Well, Ron, you mentioned earlier about hashtags. Those seem to be one of those uh, best practices that, you know, help to move things forward for, to find those uh, uh, connections, that sort of thing. What, what are, for each of the platforms that are some of your favorites, what are some of these sort of best practices that, that DIY musicians really should know about? Um, I just uh, want to add something with the, with the DIY musician approach on this is that um, I kind of co-manage a couple of, of artists as well. One's a, a guy called John Five, guitar player, very unique uh, look and feel and everything. And, you know, all the time I'm saying to him, look, you do your thing and leave this to, to like, so you can, a band can worry about all this stuff and who's got the passwords and, the, sh the right ratio of the different platforms and their, and their songs are shit. So it's going to not mean anything if you can collect people that just instantly leave day two after they've heard what your, your offering is. So, you know, I always, um, U2's manager and Led Zeppelin, they, they always made a point of saying, I don't mess with the music stuff. You guys is do. I never once gave advice on the, on a drum solo or anything, and then the same for for us. So is I think our job is to just get a picture of who this artist is, what they talk like, what they sound like, what the brand is, what the image is, and then we translate that in these little bits. 
um, that's why we're around and that's why they they do what they do. So, you know, I think the DIY, like there's a band, um, I'm going to send it to you guys. I, I'm having a blank as to what they're called, but, you know, their video is 30 or 40 million views on YouTube. They're just young and their video is so terrible. It's probably deliberately terrible. They're squinting, like no one thought to bring sunglasses. They're wearing terrible clothes. The songs, but the song is amazing. It's just some guys on a pier. Um, the hell is their name? And that to me is a great example of that. If you just worry about what you're doing, take some photos of it. Great. We'll take care of the rest. Um, so that DIY approach can, can work for that because if they've got a solid offering, they've got a solid product and they've got somewhat of a look, just amplify that. Same as you do your guitar. Just amplify what it is that you already are or want to be or want to look like or, you know, like Finn's example of the rappers. They have a lifestyle already entrenched in the way they talk, the way they dress, the way they look, everything about their world is established and they're just coming into it. They're not reinventing it. So they understand what the fan would want to see or hear or they should talk like. They probably don't even think about it. It's really subconscious and that's like, what I was saying before about some of the bands I work for, I just have been a fan since I'm a small child. So it's subconscious what I'm writing. Um, so I don't know, the ha a hashtag might be something like an obscure B-side that some people are going to get, but other people are going to be like, well, why did they put that? What is that? And they might have a conversation about it. If you can get a conversation going in the comments, you're, you're way in front. If you've got people passing and liking, that's like driving on the road and seeing a house on fire and you just slow down a bit. You keep driving. You, you don't want to get involved in that. But if you can get them stopping and talking and like, hey, what, what's happening over there? What, what is this? That's when they're coming in the rabbit hole. That's when they're, they're coming on board. Awesome. I love that. Thank you. And uh, David, can we uh, wormhole a little bit on uh, uh, what Rohan's talking about, this interactivity with the fans? Like, wh what are some things that, uh, you, you know, Rohan's got one example, but other things that, that more new artists who are trying to get to new fans how do they inspire engagement in their posts? And are there certain platforms that are better than others for it? Yeah. Um, in regards to the platforms, I think it's really important to understand that different platforms are, are used for different levels of engagement, right? Or different ways to interact with people. So Instagram's the time killer app. Um, a lot of people will sit there and scroll through it for hours and that's great. But it's also a platform where, dude, someone will pull up at a red light, they'll pull out Instagram for 30 seconds, look through stuff, light screen, and they're going to be going again. Um, Twitter is kind of the viral destination. That's where a lot of brands can kind of showcase uh, humor, which also incites a little bit of like brand vulnerability. Um, Facebook, as, as shitty as it is right now, as far as organic reach, it's still a conversation destination. Like no one pops on Facebook for 30 seconds while they're at a red light. People go to Facebook with the intent to connect and there's a great opportunity for bands to capitalize on that. I think I Prevail is one incredible example a lot of bands that are in the industry now, um, especially, I will say three years ago when I Prevail just kind of took over the metalcore market out of nowhere, a lot of bands were so pissed off because they just paid their way to the top, which is absolute bullshit, dude. Like absolute bullshit. Those dudes work their asses off, but just in a new way that was really disruptive. So you have a 29-year-old like metalcore guy who was relevant five years ago and now his band's struggling. Um, but that dude used to go to Hot Topic and sell tickets all day. He'd sit at the mall for eight hours, move tickets, move tickets, move tickets, drive to the other Hot Topic two hours away to do the same thing. 
And now just as tech and social media has grown so much, I prevail was just the first band in our market to realize, oh shit, people don't go to the mall anymore. People are on Facebook. And now there's a huge resurgence where metalcore is coming back. And I am a 100% firm believer that I prevail had a lot to do with all of the new metalcore fans that are flooding in. Like can you, David, can you real quick, can you recap for yeah. those who don't know what did I prevail do on? Yeah. This? So, so I prevail put out a, um, the same week that Taylor Swift's blank space video came out, they, they put out a really shitty um, or shitty music video for it that they filmed like on their iPhones or whatever, like a cheap household camera. It wasn't great, but it went viral. Um, a lot of people don't know that what they did following that, which was they realized that, okay, we just got so many eyes on this. We need to stay in constant communication with these people. And so Brian, the singer, um, would literally for like 20 hours a day, sit there and just respond to every comment, message every single person that liked the Facebook page and keep a conversation going. And that built such a firm foundation for them that a lot of the metalcore bands that started blowing up in like the early 2010s never really created. Um, I love Rise Records. I love Artery. Um, I love uh, Dave Shapiro, but that was the trifecta in like 2010. You get all three, you're headlining a 500 cap room in a year and a half, and you're going to have a great six year cycle and then you're washed up. Um, because a lot of bands didn't actually take the time to create this foundation. What I prevailed did is the same thing that a lot of bands were doing in Hot Topic in the, in the early 2010s. They just realized we have access to way more people now. And it's way easier for us to carry 20 genuine conversations at one time instead of me sitting in front of the freaking Dunkin' Donuts at the mall talking to one person. And so I Prevail just got really focused on doing that. And every single person that watched that Taylor Swift video, they would retarget them with a piece of original content. So a single that they wrote that sounded like the song, but now it's original music. And then they would maintain conversations with those people. Dude, okay. I hope this doesn't come across an arrogant in any way, shape, or form. We Came As Romans is not the biggest metalcore band on the planet by any means at all. But if you're a metalcore fan, a lot of the time, like you've probably heard of the band, whether you've listened to us or not, you've probably heard the name because we've been around for a long time. We supported I Prevail in 2017. We were direct support. The Word Alive was two of four and Escape the Fate was opening. All bands that have been around for a decade or longer. I'd go back to the merch table every night with our merch guy and I kid you not, I would get 15 to 20 people a night asking me, I've never heard of you guys before. Is this your first album? All of I Prevail's fans are new, right? And that was the, created a massive resurgence in the metalcore market. And there's other you know, um, um, people that were involved in doing that. But I think they finally, a lot of people in the industry just despised them for so long. And now they realize like, oh, these guys are actually really cool. They're genuine guys who just work really hard and they worked in a way that wasn't being capitalized on by the rest of the industry. And now everybody's playing catch up. Um, but dude, I think that was, that they're such a great example of being ahead of the curve and looking at what opportunities are on the table for bands to take advantage of. And dude, I think Finn nailed it. The reason that SoundCloud rappers blew up isn't because it, it was the most um, groundbreaking music in the world. It's they just, they did something new. They engaged with people consistently and they were coming from a genuine place. Um, you know, like whether they're conscious about it or not, their brand identity is so locked into who they are and they genuinely don't give a shit about if people liked it or not. And it created a whole new culture that blew up and blew up massively. Not to mention they were already capitalizing on, um, really making sure that like user consumption was optimized for people. You know, SoundCloud, when, as soon as that platform was created and it kind of put the ability for artists to release content whenever they want, it disrupted the whole album cycle strategy. And so that genre was kind of the first to just get on, you know, screw doing an album cycle and risk putting a hundred grand into something that could get disrupted because of bad PR or another artist coming along and doing something at the same time. Let's just focus on putting singles out every week and shoot, if it's crushing it for eight weeks, then maybe we just don't release a single. If people hated it, no worries. I'll release a single a week later. It allows you to adapt to the market and become so versatile that it, it really eliminates so much of your risk. I'm look. I'm so looking forward to that uh, stretching well beyond that genre, but that's yeah, beyond the scope. So, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, uh, great content done consistently over time. It, it's social media as well, right? 
um, it's difficult to call what I Prevail did uh, a hack. When you spend 20 hours a day working on something, it's hard to say, oh yeah, he hacked it. Because the word hack seems to suggest that you found a way to do it easy. But uh, in terms of how to do it well, even that seems to be a challenge uh, when it comes to social media for a lot of bands. So um, uh, when it comes to the hard work, what have you uh, expected from and demanded from your clients in the past in terms of social media and what they create there? Yeah, I mean, a bit of what Rohan attested to, which is with the artists that he manages or, you know, the ones that he's hired on to consult for, I expect the artists to create that content. And we, you know, I'm not the expert, but again, I go to guys like the experts that we've assembled here to be able to get those strategies. If the artist wants to participate in it, and in fact, I encourage that as often as I can, because if they can get educated, if they're interested in getting educated as to what well, it will, what will then happen afterwards, like what these guys will do with that content, it might help them, you know, tweak things just a bit in order to, to make that content even more marketable. So, um, yeah, that's really it. <laughs> well, thank you. No, uh, Finn, uh, genre and brand, uh, are really important to most artists careers. Uh, what are some best practices for finding a balance between the quantity and quality that you were talking about earlier uh, when it comes to the brand itself to circle us back to the very beginning? Well, I think what you want to look for is what is the sort of core thing that your audience responds to in terms of, you know, the content. So do they like it when you do silly pranks or do they, like it when you share behind the scenes stuff or like what are, what are the sort of you're going to come up with i don't know two three four things that reliably people like and then like how do you execute that in the most efficient way and i think there is an incorrect belief that um budget and results are correlated and i don't think they are because i'm sure all of us have worked on things that had a huge budget and flopped and then we have all worked on or seen things that had no budget and did really well. So, uh, you know, with, with the understanding that, you know, there's only so many hours in a day and we can't all do everything, there's something you can do that people will respond to, that they'll engage with, that takes, you know, very little effort. There's something you can do, or very little time, I should say, because it's about like the thinking. It's not about the, it's not about the production and the execution for most, for most things. I mean, there's some things that do legitimately require a lot of production, but if if the constraint is time you know for example i know if i if i ever tweet about attack attack it will get a ton of engagement i can i can press that button as many times as i want and people will like it every single time i don't mean that in a cynical way i just by experimenting by putting stuff out i've realized that's the thing people care about um people are nostalgic about tony hawk pro skater i can talk about that as much as i want and people will engage with it and that's true for artists too. There's something that you're going to like, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head, but like for a lot of artists, if they've been around for a long time, for example, we came as Romans or, or Joey Sturgis. So a good example. So our, I'm sure most of us know him. Anytime he posts stuff from the old days, some picture of him when he used to work in his shitty, you know, uh, garage with, you know, the devil wears Prada or something like that, that will crush. And it doesn't take him, more than 10 seconds to post that. And that's, you know, sort of capitalizing on some history that, you know, younger artists may not have. But the point is, find that thing, whether, whether you're pulling a, pushing on a nostalgia button or some sort of current events, or, you know, again, maybe just people like seeing you do something silly. Once you figure out what those things are, then the question is, how do we execute that in the most efficient way possible? Uh, can we save 30%? You know, can we do that thirty percent faster? Can we do it fifty percent faster? But that, to me, is how you serve, how you solve the quantity versus quality thing. Is you, you start by finding what people like, and then how do you execute that in the quickest way possible? I think I follow up with you on that. Like you know, with a platform like Instagram, you're limited by an image. Uh, uh, Twitter, you're limited by a number of characters. YouTube seems to be like it's wide open. You can do a twenty-four hour 
seven day a week uh, uh, data bots uh, uh, YouTube stream, sure. you know, like, and, and, but you could also post up something that's a few seconds long. Are there any uh, challenges uh, that are unique to YouTube or is it just psychological on YouTube as to how often you can or cannot post on that form? Uh, I would say YouTube has the biggest potential upside of any social media platform. And it's also the most difficult to sort of build an audience on. And the reason why is because you're competing with a lot of people who are really, really, really good that already have really big audiences. And that's tough. Uh, and YouTube sort of rewards people who, you know, my videos get recommended a lot because people watch them, which means more people watch them, which means they get recommended more. So it, it, it sort of rewards established people. And that's true of every platform, but I think it's especially true of YouTube. Uh, so to me, the, the most challenging thing about YouTube is that it's probably going to take you, unless you're really good, uh, it's probably gonna take you six to nine to 12 months to really get anywhere there. Uh, and once you do, it's very valuable. Um, I mean, if I didn't put out a video at all this month, I'd still probably get half a million views in the next month. Um, now that wouldn't last forever, but so I think YouTube in particular, the challenge is like putting in, being able to commit the time it takes to build up that kind of first initial bit of traction because it's hard and it's demoralizing and you're going to invest a lot of time and energy into something that feels like it's going nowhere. Yeah, let me take a moment to say hi to everybody watching this on YouTube. Uh, Jeff, uh, when uh, it, as far as YouTube, it seems like I, I, I totally agree with Finn on that idea that like this is a, a just a, a a really awesome opportunity. To me, it seems like a really great opportunity to also deepen a fan relationship to try to you know turn a, a casual fan into a, a the type of fan who's going to do a VIP package sometime in the future. That sort of thing. Is, is that true or am I mistaken? Is, is, are there, uh, is there a better place to develop a fan from a casual fan to a, a, a super fan than YouTube? Well, I mean, you know, like Facebook, they offer a top fan options, so it's, they're able to identify fans. For, for me, um, during a touring cycle, I see the most this is a broad statement, but I see a lot of conversion when I'm when we're doing a co-headline, and we use like geotags and looking through the uh, the additional artists through their <clears throat> posts um, using their tags as well. So that's where I've seen some of that my highest conversion for for YouTube for me personally. It's great because there's a lot of covers, um, you know, drum, bass, guitar covers of artists that I work with or they're doing press or, you know, like various archival interviews because I also work with similar to, to Rohan where I, I work with a lot of artists who have had 20, 30 year careers. So for me, the, that platform is great because I'm able to engage with people who have uploaded that archival content over the last, you know, 20 plus years. Um, so that's great for conversion. Um, but I still, you know, for me, it, for my demo, you know, Facebook is still, I know the organic reach is, is much lower and, you know, like one out of every five posts is, is basically an ad in, in your feed. It's still great for me because they were so highly populated when the artists, you know, started, you know, a decade or so ago. So that was the first network that we that we built on other than like MySpace and Friendster and that. So, Gotcha. Rohan, can you uh, sort of pick up from there? Like uh, when you're working with uh, artists and there are the platforms that are, are now getting a little long in the tooth, are there newer platforms that are just uh, exciting and, and that you think like uh, are the, the, the place everybody needs to be uh, and focusing on going into the future? Um, honestly, no, not really. I've got uh, the band, the bands themselves are, di I find it, uh, I separate them from the band members. Um, now that's an interesting distinction because the band may represent something that a fan has an image of and then the band member can go off and do what it is that they do. So I've got a bunch of guys on um, uh, Twitch, I think, and um, I'm going blank. Is There's too many for us to keep track of here. Um, TikTok, they're loving TikTok right now. That's um, 
the traction on that is just completely enormous. The views on that are enormous. The engagement on that is just out of control. And I have a few band members from the bands that have their own name, their own personalities as well, that have now shifted over to that um, because they get to be funny. They get to be, it gets a, it's a little short clip. It's a, maybe a joke or it's a, you know, day in the life type stuff, which people love. You just cannot get enough of behind the scenes in, in terms of letting people into kind of what you do for a bit. Um, so for me, that's the one. And I, and I think when, when, um, the, a band member themselves has something to say, it's almost at the point, depending on the size of your following, where you do branch off and become your own, um, you become your own personality. Because that's an important thing too. You've got two, three, four, five different people in a band. All of them see the world differently. All of them have a different opinion. Um, there may be a management decision to stifle that initially in so that the representation of the band doesn't get derailed in a different direction. That's important for socials. Um, but I think once you get a, a solid base, uh, that's when you can start to branch off. So, yeah, uh, maybe maybe TikTok is is probably the, the one at the moment. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. David, uh, you were nodding and thumbs up and everything as soon as the word tick, TikTok came up. So what should people be doing? I've had oh. this app on my phone for like a month and I stare yeah. at it. Like, oh, I don't get it. So we were we relate to the TikTok party, right? Because we're all 29 through 31 and we're like, no, that's dumb. Which is the same thing I said when Instagram came out. And it's the same thing I said when Facebook came out and I was on MySpace. <laughs> and I said the same thing about when MySpace came out when I was on Zanga. And I said the same thing about Zanga from LiveJournal. So I've constantly been late to adapt out of ego, right? Um, and so as soon as I was like, okay, I looked up social metrics on TikTok and it's like, okay, 41% of all the active users are between the ages of 16 and 24. Looking at this as a 10 year band, right? Meaning most of our fans uh, found us around our third al album cycle and then phased out. Um, and then during our fourth album cycle, we had to completely, you know, redo who our fan base was. Now about 60 to 70% of our fans are all new. They found us in the last four years. That was a very intentional move, but it took a very long period of time. Um, so wanting to figure out how can we, you know, essentially grab a younger fan base who are going to become uh, lifelong fans. We really want to assign like LTV or lifetime value to those people. Um, so 41% of all active TikTok users are between the ages of 16 to 24. And then on top of that, the average daily usage for TikTok is like between 53 minutes and an hour. So all of the people that are on the platform are on there consistently throughout the day. And the way that their algorithms deliver content is it's not chronologically, which is great. It's all based on user engagement. So you could have something that you posted three months ago that all of a sudden goes viral. So it allows you to keep every single post or every piece of content that you put out to be leveraged as an asset rather than just something that you posted that was relevant for a week or two weeks and then the engagement bottomed out like you see on Facebook or Instagram because it gets so buried, or Twitter, because it gets so buried in your feed. On TikTok, there's an opportunity at any moment for all of those to just organically go viral depending on what's going on in the, in the marketplace. So it's also really easy to put content out um, because automatically you're going to see what's going viral that day. And you can be like, oh, like this band member is goofy. I'm going to tell them to do this 20 second skit. Um, and all of a sudden you might get, even if you only have 200 followers, you might get 30,000 likes on it. And all of a sudden there's all new people coming in. We just created our TikTok that we came as Romans TikTok like a week and a half ago. It's not verified yet or anything. We only have like 3,500 followers on it. Um, but and, and we can't implement the law of large numbers, looking at like overall massive social analytics trends. But based off the metrics we're seeing, it is unlike any of the other social stats we see on any other platform. Normally about 60% of our followers uh, or, or of the followers that are engaged with us are male, 40% female. It's 69% female 
31% male on this platform. I got excited about that because I can look at all of our purchase metrics and see that even though we sell more units in volume as far as merchandise to men, women spend about twice as much per transaction that men do. So if there's an untapped market here for us to build a new fan base with women, who based on these other social metrics spend twice as much as men do, this could become a major profit center for us. Um, not to mention, it's the easiest way for us to engage with people. It's built around, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Collaborating with other people. You know, you can ease, someone can easily take a post and say, oh, I wanna do a duet with this. So we actually built an entire social campaign that we're starting to roll out this weekend built around duets and trying to get people to duet with the band. Um, also, since it's a new platform, they haven't minim like minimized any delivery. Like there's no paywall for access to your reach right now. That'll probably take place in a year and a half to two years, maybe. Um, and then also in the hard rock metalcore market, there are no bands doing it right now. None. None. It's like us, Crown the Empire, just made theirs a few days ago. All Time Low has been on it for about a month. But like Beartooth's not on it. I Prevail's not on it. Three Days Grace is on it. And they do like a fan share every Friday or something. But it's an untapped market. And I think that there's a massive opportunity for a lot of bands to become the I Prevail of kind of the next wave who really capitalize on that platform like I Prevail did with Facebook. It's awesome, David. You had, I was counting in my head, seven wormholes that I really wanted to go in and I got to avoid all of them. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm I'm like no, a dog chasing the wind. But each of them is, is just like oh oh, because all I want to do is turn to Rohan, Jeff, and Finn and say, okay, talk to me about this. But I can't because I got to circle back on something Finn said probably like 35 minutes ago. And thank you so much, David, on that summary on TikTok because now everybody's running. Oh, at absolutely. <laughs> well, Finn, you were saying earlier that just don't bother with Facebook, which surprised me or something along those lines. Perhaps I'm putting words in your mouth and. It surprised me because it seems like um, Facebook events is so powerful for marketing live performance. And the Facebook ad engine is so well developed. The AI is so well developed at this point. So uh, can you talk about Facebook events and talk about the, the uh, I guess, all of these platforms in terms of advertising and where the great opportunities are for, for uh, musicians at this point? Well, I can't really talk about Facebook events because I don't promote any live events. So uh, that's a fair point. That's probably useful. Uh, I guess my point is that uh, I hear a lot of rock people kind of obsessing about getting very precious about organic reach on Facebook, on Facebook and, you know, caring a lot about how many likes their band page has, which is, is just kind of, you're five years late on that, you know? Uh, I mean, if get the likes by all means, that's great, but uh, I would not go out of my way uh, to emphasize that. And by the way, there's no reason that, like, if you have a good piece of content on Instagram, it'll do fine on Facebook too. I mean, there's, you know, it, there's, there's no reason that you can't repurpose it. Um, as far as ads go, I mean, yeah, Facebook, I've tried so many times to get, I mean, you know, David would, would have some good input here too, but I tried so many times to get the results on Facebook. And when I say Facebook ads, I'm referring to the Facebook ad platform, which as some people may or may not know, will distribute your ads into many places. Facebook.com and the Facebook app is one of those places. Instagram, WhatsApp, the ad network there, you know, I don't know how many placements there are now, like 25 or something like that. Um, so Facebook ads offer the best ROI of anything I've been able to find. I've tried many times to duplicate it because I don't want to be so dependent on one channel, but they're just so damn good at it. I am interested to see where TikTok goes because I know they've been investing a lot in their ad tech and they seem to be avoiding a lot of the mistakes that uh, other companies made. And the big one being like with Snapchat, they were never able to, well, not never, but they've always struggled to monetize their users adequately. I mean, that's, that's the problem with Snapchat is that for a long time there, the, the value of a user was negative relative to the amount that it cost them to acquire that user. Uh, it seems that TikTok, they seem to have a good management team. You know, they just hired the former CEO or their new CEO was the former head of Disney plus. So it seems like they are doing a lot of things right. And I'm optimistic about the future of their ad platform, but uh, I, I don't think it's there yet. Um, so 
point being, the way I think about Facebook is, or really any of these platforms, like if you want to move, if you want to move product by ads, that's what they're for. Uh, if you want to create engagement and build an audience and a community and stuff, that's what organic content is for. Uh, not to say that you shouldn't ever promote your stuff like you should, but it, it's use the things for what they're meant for. If you want to sell shit, buy ads. If you want to talk to people, make content. I think it's the number one mistake I would say that people in all kinds of business make is they promote stuff too much. Yeah. And nobody wants that. Like, you know, it's like the punishers that hand, that stand out uh, outside of a show and like shove their CD in your face. And it's like, I don't want that. I don't know you. Yeah. Stop trying to sell me something. Um, and that's the same way people feel about their, uh, about their social feeds. So I guess in regards to Facebook, sure, if you get some likes, that's great. Use it. But if you are putting a lot of energy into building up a Facebook page in 2020, that's not a smart use of your time, in my opinion. Gotcha. Rohan, I know you've got to run, so if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you before you do uh, about the same thing, uh, advertising on platforms, best practices. One of the things that I'm always wondering about is how, like with uh, in particular the Facebook ad platform, for example, you're able to really hyper-target when you've got people's email addresses and yet so few bands bother with collecting their email and keeping an autoresponder, that sort of thing. So can you talk about some best practices for advertising that you recommend and, and that you perhaps utilize in places where it works and where it doesn't? Um, well, amazingly, our company is talking to David's company about uh, him doing that stuff for us because, uh, man, I have no idea about any of that. I'm so, like, old school. You know. Um, we know it's there and we know we need it. Um, but when you have specialists that, that look into it, it's just amazing that the, the very person that we're all talking to is, is here right now. So, um, so I don't want to divert, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, look guys, I'm so sorry. I have to leave. This is amazing. I hopefully we can do it again, but, um, I kind of feel like we should talk about this stuff once a month anyway and uh, share things that we're, we're picking up along the way because it's, you know, how often do you run into another social manager who's sitting here trying to figure this thing out? So, yeah, it's been great. Thanks, Mike, Paul, for, for uh, setting it up. And it's great to Thanks meet you. Thanks for having Great to connect with you, buddy. Talk we'll to you soon. Bye. I hope I can hold the rest of you for just a few more minutes, if that's okay. Uh, David, this is a great segue to you. I guess uh, do you want to <laughs> pick that up from, from where we're Yeah, up? Yeah. Um, so a lot of people don't know, and I'll try to keep this short. Um, a lot of people don't know what all data is floating around, like from a band's Facebook page, from their Instagram page, et cetera. Um, Facebook will never allow D2C data direct to consumer, right? So you're not going to get their first name, last name, email address, zip code, IP. You're not going to get any of that stuff, right? If you have a good CRM platform, um, and I recommend Clavio, um, which I, I'm new to the platform, but it's incredible. That's where you can upload all of that content. But Facebook does allow you access to anyone that's been to your Instagram page, whether they follow you or not anyone that's been to your Facebook page, whether they follow you or not, you can even segment it down based on their level of engagement. People who engaged with this specific post, but not this one, um, or people who saved this post, people who commented on this post, you can do the same with all the video content on both of those platforms as well. And you can segment that based on seven varying levels of engagement. So you can retarget people that watch three seconds of the video, 10 seconds of the video, 15 seconds, 25%, 50%, 75%, 95%. Um, like you said, with the, um, the email addresses for bands that do have a newsletter, you can export that as a CSV or comma separated value file, and you can upload all of that. So when it comes to, um, and my background in doing this isn't for bands. I was doing this for tons of different companies in tons of different industries. And when I joined We Came As Romans, it was like, oh shit, let's just do this for our next album cycle, because if we don't, we're fucked. Because um, our fourth album cycle tanked. We went from like 1,200 cap rooms to... Uh, 300 cap rooms and we immediately knew like okay we need to get this new album directly to all of our core fans that loved us from the first three album cycles and uh so i got csv files 
from our old label and from our merch company of anybody that ever bought a piece of We Came As uh, Romans merch in that time frame. And for the initial uh, release of the album, every single dollar as far as paid efforts went to just retargeting those people to essentially say, hey, our fourth album sucked and we know that. And uh, here's an album that doesn't suck that we think you're going to like. So we could rebuild that trust and rebuild that foundation. Um, Meanwhile, all that new data is coming in. We debuted the videos on Facebook exclusively before getting them onto YouTube so we could keep everything inside of our digital database there. And all these audiences update every three to five seconds. So as users start to engage with the content, they're compartmentalizing or segmenting themselves into those various audiences that you've created. Now we can just look at a broad view of, of the 100,000 people that watched this video, um, we had 80,000 people that watched 10 seconds of it. Well, why did we lose the 20,000 people? Maybe the first 15 seconds of the video is not engaging, or maybe they just didn't like it. But the good news is, as long as they watch three seconds, you can retarget them and follow them around the internet. So the ads aren't just going to run on Facebook or Instagram. They'll pop up on whatever apps the user is using, whatever other websites they're visiting, and you're only paying for impressions on those. So it's, it's a very cheap way to stay in touch with those fans, but it, al it allows you a macro view of, here's all the people that are the least engaged with our content, and here's the people that are the most engaged. These are the people that watched 95% of all three music videos we've released. It's probably time to target them for a pre-order bundle or something along those lines, because we can see exactly how engaged they are with the content. Uh, David, I, I'm, I'm, I, my brain wants to ask you about abandoned cart retargeting, but I'm not going to do it. Oh, I love it. I I'm love not going to do it. <laughs> but I do want to ask you about how effective YouTube ads can be. I think they can be great. Um, we have hyperculture. The way our business is structured is we have three different specialists that have three different backgrounds. So I'm familiar with the AdWords platform. I've done a bunch of campaigning on it, but Tanner is normally our, our go-to guy in that regard. Um, to my knowledge, which is much more limited than him, and as Jeff was saying, like YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world behind Google. Um, and YouTube is owned by Google and it's exclusively video-based content. So the fact that it's the second largest search engine is just absolutely unreal. The retargeting possibilities there, as well as like the ad placement there, it's really easy for, a, let's say a band wants to have market share with Wage War, right? Great. You can go just drop your music video as a pre-roll or a mid-roll ad on Wage War's YouTube channel or on the Fearless Records YouTube channel in that case. And you can retarget video viewers who saw that ad with original pieces of content. Um, they don't allow the same sophistication of, of data segmentation that Facebook does. Um, so I'm always going to be biased and err on the Facebook side. Um, as long as you have a good strategy, I think that your dollar is going to go a lot further on Facebook, but I think that YouTube has way more importance when it comes to longevity, which is where Finn's expertise would come in and like really building brand culture on your channel there and really making sure that you're putting, you know, not only uh, quality content out, but that it's being delivered consistently um, not only as far as like the timeline of when you're getting that out, but it's that it's also kind of in alignment with your overall brand ethos. So I would say, you know, there's so much, there's so many free resources out there. Like all the shit that I learned was from experience. I never went to school. Um, I learned through trial and error from starting my first company for digital marketing stuff. And I hired a lot of coaches and made a lot of mistakes all the way, but most of it was listening to a lot of great podcasts and reading a lot of great books. So I would say, Put one of your band guys who seems to be the most like detail oriented or data driven person, put them, make that their field and then give someone else the responsibility of YouTube and make that their full time thing in the band for six to nine months. And you can see quantifiable improvement, not only in the audience that you're building, but if your band is already cash flowing even a little bit, you can scale that pretty drastically. It takes a long time to get your bands to a point where it's cash flowing. Um, and that's something with hyperculture. We have a developing artist program that we are insanely strict on because most bands come in and they're like, oh, we're going to hire this agency and they're going to blow us up really quickly. Fuck no, we're not. Um, we can compress the amount of time that it takes to get there, but I never want a band coming on and thinking, hey, we're going to hire this agency and it's going to start paying for itself in two months. Now, people can become curious about your band 
but they won't become a, a raving fan until they have some kind of emotional experience. Most of the time, that's going to be they see you at a show. And we yeah. can get more bodies in the room for you the first time you play there, sure. But it's still up to the band to win those people over. Sometimes it can be your song got someone through a, a very difficult emotional time in their life. Um, and that's incredible. But that's, that's the anomaly. Most of the time, it's you've got to get your butts into rooms and you've got to play. I don't get why bands that are starting out now aren't playing as many shows as possible. It just seems stupid to me. That's the only uh, right place now, you're going to win fans over. Right now, they're not, and it's understandable. But even but is, your, it, is your experience that 90% of the time that data-oriented guy is the drummer? Yeah. Uh, no, it's normally the singer. Okay. Yeah, it's normally the singer or the guitarist. I don't know if that's like going against anything y'all have experienced, but normally drummers just care about drums. Jeff, I, I, I got a segue because I, 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 you know, I'd ask you about a self-liquidating funnel and a whole bunch of other stuff that I, I'd love to also dig into. But what, but one of the things that like I uh, that I have in mind is just that it's uh, Spotify is such a huge thing for every artist. It seems to be so freaking important to get those followers, to get those uh, those streams. Spotify itself is almost a social media platform. Do you look at it as a so as a social media platform, or is it incidental? And how do you work on increasing streams and increasing follower counts on Spotify for your artists through social media? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, and and it's you know progressively become more and more of a social network in itself with Spotify for artists and you know when I'm creating assets now in addition to creating for all the you know all of our primary socials I need to create Spotify canvas and headers and profile images for Spotify and all the, the various um, optimized graphics and, and video content respectively for, for that so um, it's also a great way too to encourage band members to create playlists that you can curate across socials and to <clears throat> you know, reach out and communicate with playlist curators to get placements for your band because, you know, we're, we get radio sends us updates weekly and those, you know, account for a, a large percentage of where plays, plays are coming from, you know, through playlist curators and whether it's Spotify branded or, you know, more independent, like that's, we're seeing, there's a large portion of them coming from both, so. Awesome. Finn, can you talk about like uh, how you use Spotify? If you use Spotify, is there uh, advantages inside the, the data that you can get from Spotify? Uh, how, does, how do you look upon Spotify in terms of social media? Well, you guys all probably know more about Spotify than I do uh, since I don't actually distribute anything on there. So you guys would be a better source of information than I would. But what I do, uh, as, as, uh, as, as you said, it is more of a social platform all the time. So what I do, I realized people were always, when I make a video about, say, metalcore, pop punk or something, some particular flavor of it, people would ask, can you make a Spotify playlist of all the songs you mentioned? And so I started doing that. And, uh, you know, they're not huge or anything like that, but I have like, I don't know, I think the biggest one I have is maybe 10,000 followers or something, which isn't bad. Uh, and so to me, that's just, uh, I'm not really aggressively trying to grow those playlists. I'm just using that as a way to deepen my relationship with the audience. Just another way for them to have a playlist. Like every time they open up Spotify and they see they have one of my playlists saved, they just remember me one more time. Uh, and also it's nice that some of them actually, I guess, are popular enough. I get a lot of outreach. I have one that's like emo rap stuff which is not the biggest one by any means, but for some reason I get hit up a lot for that one. Um, I don't know why, uh, but it's, it's cool that they're getting out there enough that people care. And uh, I've actually gotten hit up by a couple artists and, and I generally speak, this probably make me sound like a dick, but generally speaking, I absolutely hate it when people hit me up about my playlists because it happens so often and it's almost always garbage. But that one in particular, I've gotten hit up by a lot of like pretty cool, like good and substantial artists. Uh, and so the way I use Spotify is it's just sort of another 
I would think of it as like the seasoning on top of the main course for me personally. Um, and uh, those playlists, man, people care about them. That's the big thing I would take away from it. So if I was in a band, I would make a playlist about the genre that we are in with my band on it, you know, knowing that people care about these things. That's what I would do. Yeah. Not to mention uh, how you trick the algorithm, as they say, uh, David, uh, Spotify. <laughs> So I, I've been in a position where like, you know, I started touring full time in 07. My band, my first band, the Crimson Armada signed a very shitty, we were a tax write off and didn't know it, you know, to like a big label. And uh, we learned that later on. But um, I've never had the deal with submitting on my own because um, any band that I've been in has been signed to a label. I, I do believe hands down, I know that anyone in, in a, anyone who's in a band thinks Spotify or DSP suck because we're all pigeonholed in contracts that pay us jack shit on them. But for any artist that's out there that's independent and owns their music, you can make a terrifying amount of money off of streams right now. Finn and I are both really close with Johnny Frank, whose project is Bill Murray. Um, he, he and I grew up K through 12 together. Our dads were in bluegrass bands. Um, and then Finn, I don't know how you guys connected. Um, if you guys have just known each other from like being in the scene or back in the attack days or something. Long story, Columbus, friends of friends. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I forgot you lived in Columbus for a while. Okay, yes. So um, Johnny is doing great, and I can't get into specific numbers or any of that stuff, but like he owns his music independently. His brand is goofy as hell because um, he almost has that like he just doesn't care and does it because it's fun mentality, um, and he makes a living off of his streams outside of merch, outside of touring, outside of anything else. And there are so many artists that are doing that right now. I think Spotify creates more of an opportunity for bands this day and age um, that has existed in the past seven to 10 years, realistically. But how, but how about like utilizing it as a social media platform or using right. it as a way to social media gets people to? So, so the, making it accessible is gonna be one thing, whether it's Linktree, whatever, make sure you're copying the URL from your actual page. Like don't put it through a bit URL or something. If I put an artist URL through like bit.ly, then all of a sudden when someone clicks on it, it pulls it up in a browser. Um, but if I pull it up uh, just directly from the artist profile and then paste that, say into a link tree or something along those lines, and you click on that, it'll pull it up in the user's native app. Um, which eliminates, you know, two further steps for the user to make. If it pulls it up in a browser, they're going to have to close out of the browser or log in and then pull up the app and do it. It's all about the path of least resistance and making it accessible as possible. Something else that I, I think a lot of um, developing artists overlook is the metadata in your tracks are unbelievably important when it comes to securing any kind of playlisting. Um, metadata is basically just the, the text information that you're putting in about the song. Right, so who wrote the song? What BMI or ASCAP affiliation is there? Is there a, a guest vocalist? If so, what band? Um, and whatever, it's essentially the product description for your track when you're entering it. A lot of bands will skip that over. Spotify won't consider a song if, if the metadata is inaccurate or if there's no metadata. Um, to my knowledge, the other thing that a lot of bands mess up on is they'll submit the song for release like three or four days before the actual drop date which doesn't even give it enough time to get in the Spotify uh, playlist curator's queue to listen through the music. So it's recommended that you submit about four to five weeks out. And that actually puts the song in queue, which there's, you know, actual people, the curators are actual people who sit there and listen to all this bullshit, most of which is probably bad. And then they think, hey, this one slaps, I'm going to put it on this playlist. Um, but if you don't give it enough time to get through the queue, it's l not likely that someone's going to happen to listen to it right away and throw it on there. So, um, as far as like increasing your chances for organic playlisting, um, submit it four to five weeks out and make sure that the metadata when you enter it is as accurate as possible. Awesome. Mike, can you take us home? How about um, this? Here's a question for you. Like during that album, uh, that album rollout, you know, there are the social media posts that try to get people to go to the YouTube. There's the social media posts that direct to the Spotify. How are you as a manager trying to balance 
uh, where those posts go to, or do you just not care as long as it's just getting out there so that people can uh, can can uh, get exposed to what the album that's being promoted? No, I mean we uh, are focusing on what's immediately in front of us, and then how is that going to allow us to leverage our long-term goals? So if we're putting an album out, most likely we're going to want to get eyes and ears on videos, whether that's on YouTube or streams, whether that's Spotify or Apple Music. But inevitably, how are we then taking some of that data, as David describes, and then parlaying that into something? Because he said, most bands I manage are signed to labels. That's not direct income back to us. So then we're focusing on things that are coming directly into our pocket, typically in the genres that we've been discussing. And Ice Nine Kills and you know, is t-shirts. Um, or something else of that nature. I mean, the beautiful thing about this panel, and I'll try to wrap it up is, you know, I, I see, it's so hard to actually do. To me, I couldn't go it alone, and I really couldn't do it without at least two of any of these guys that have been on the call with us today. I've gotta have the band that's creating the content, right, where it's originating from, having that story that Finn likes to tell, um, then I've got to have somebody advising, or, you know, at least on what the best content is for whatever the goals are. And then I've got to have somebody that's helping maximize that, uh, you know, that data to reach the people that unfortunately aren't, aren't always reachable because of the way that the, you know, the, the platforms are set up. So the good news is I don't, I don't find any fault in that. I think the business models are the business models. And I try to always encourage the artists, let's find a way to utilize, you know, the, the the expertises that are out there. And again, I'm in a fortunate position. I haven't had to go watch all the videos and educate myself in the capacity that these guys have because the artists I manage, we can actually afford these guys. But prior to doing all of that, right, I spent years and years doing similar things, just, you know, it wasn't really for the social media componentry of it. So um yeah to me the takeaway for any developing artist is and, and really any established artist is if you're willing to do the work and or have the resources to to get in in you know in cahoots with any of these guys you really can start to see returns that are so much greater than uh than you know would be if you weren't doing any of this stuff so that's exciting yeah jeff david finn mike thank you all very much for being here really appreciate it i mean the information is just fantastic so thank you so much for your time really really great. really appreciate it from all of you guys I'll follow thank up. you guys for for having me man it really really i'm honored to be here same here rock and roll thanks finn thanks jeff thanks dave